how's it going? Here we go. We are starting World War One. All right. So in part one, which is what this lecture is going to be, we're going to look at the causes and major events. So how is it that the world goes to war? You know, like that's crazy to think about how the world goes to war, not once, but twice. And 19th century gets the nickname the bloody century. And that's for a reason, because we have so many bloody events and it definitely is kicked off or started with the first world war. So for this, um, I would have the main PowerPoint or something to take notes on because there's a lot of events or things to keep track of. And then I would, um, have your questions as well, okay? So the date range for this chapter, 1900 to 1929, okay? So we're gonna look at kind of the setting, the stage building up to 1914 to 1918. Geographic location of World War I is gonna be Europe, um, the major location of this war. Uh, key civilization, so who's involved in the war? Uh, and it's gonna be mostly European countries. So Russia, Germany, France, Britain, Belgium, Austria, Hungary, Ottoman Empire, and then eventually the US will join later on in the war. Okay, so those are the major things that I would have involved. All right, so let's look at the causes. Let's start with causes of the First World War. So for part one, setting the stage, aggressive nationalism is going to be a part of this. Okay, so this is more than just pride in one's country. This is like, you know, going beyond that. This is this is not just pride in one's country. This is looking for a fight, looking to prove themselves. And we have three really major examples of that, okay? Um, so for a cause, I would definitely say aggressive nationalism. One is going to be Germany. Germany is a new country. Otto von Bismarck, right, who was very manipulative, um, a great military general, um, and how he manipulated Prussia and Austria and France, you know, throughout this and was able to unify Germany um, and stuff into unification. They are looking to not only be a part of Europe, but to dominate Europe. Europe and the Industrial Revolution. Um, they were dominant in the African scramble, and now they're looking to be dominant amongst Europeans. The French. The French are humiliated, and they're always looking to kind of regain the reputation, you know? It goes all the way back to French and Indian War, the American Revolution, the French Revolution. They're, they're, they're licking their wounds from, um, you know, Napoleon. They're hypersensitive, the Franco-Prussian War. And, um, and so they're always, you know, anybody says anything, they're ready to defend their honor. Russia, who has time and again been rejected, been rejected by Europeans, and they're tired of it. They're tired of it, and they want to be accepted, and they're not going to put up with it anymore. Economic rivalry is really becoming a thing, you know. Um, they're running out of places to colonize, and so now they're starting to run into each other. Britain has been top dog for a long time, and Germany is looking to dethrone them, and Britain doesn't want to let go. Uh, Germany feels upset. They feel like they aren't getting the respect they deserve, and a lot of people feel like they're kind of this hot-headed teenager, you know, new on the block who hasn't really earned their respect, while Germany feels like, no, you guys need to respect what we've done. So there's a lot of tempers, a lot of flexing, and this never ends well. Imperialism has been going on. We've talked about this for several chapters, right? 26, 27, 28, and 29. And what's happened is they've run out of places to colonize. Um, Africa was the final frontier of imperialism, right? You know, the, the scramble for Africa in the 1890s in the Berlin Conference. And so now they're getting in each other's way. Uh, Germany and France are going to fight over Morocco and almost go to war, you know? Uh, France is going to side with Britain and sees Germany as, you know, cocky and who do you think you are? You're a new country and we need to put them in their place. You know, so there's a lot of flexing and competition, intimidation. Um, militarization is very glorified, you know, building up of arms, it's romanticized. And the social Darwinism of being more advanced is no longer just toward racial groups and discriminatory. It's toward one another now, okay? And even toward, you know, by skin color might look the same, but different nationalities, you know, saying, you know, one country over another. And it's romanticized. This idea of being dominant and going to war is, is definitely romanticized through the media, through um, magazines, through um, storylines. And people just have this idea that if we don't go to war and prove ourselves, somehow we aren't living up to our full potential. And this leads to an arms race. 
and the arms race is who has most weapons, who has the best weapons, um, and people want to show off. Here's an example of the new warships. Um, these were called the dreadnoughts. These were the large new warships. These were two football fields on. I mean, these things were massive. Okay, a dozen gun, you know, gu um, guns on these things. These things were absolutely massive. So it's not only who had these, but who had the most of these. And the, for example, the uh, British Navy had 19 of them. The Germans had 13 of them. You know, so everybody's trying to build up who had them. You know, the United States only had eight. You know, at that time. So it was. It was a big arms race competition, you know, who would have the most and could show off and again, kind of flexing toward one another. While the spirit of nationalism flourished across Europe, many countries were building their global empires. Great Britain and Germany were colonizing Africa and the Middle East in a frenzy of imperialism. France and Germany were now rivals at home and abroad as they clashed over control of Morocco. Russia turned its attention to Europe as she sought control over the Serbs. The contest for international trade, resources, and land soon resulted in a buildup of military strength. The British, Germans, French, Italians, Japanese, and Americans began an arms race, stockpiling weapons, recruiting armies, and launching battleships to protect their interests at home and abroad. As each country amassed countless weapons and beefed up their army and navies, they saw the wisdom of agreeing to military alliances, mutual treaties of assistance that would commit each nation to support one another should they be attacked. By 1914, there were two major defense alliances. The Triple Entente, later called the Allies, consisted of France, Great Britain, and Russia, although Russia had a separate treaty with Serbia. The other, the Triple Alliance, later called the Central Powers, included Germany, Austria-Hungary, the Ottoman Empire, and Italy. Italy would later join the Allies. For a little while, these military alliances served as a type of checks and balances system, with each nation reluctant to upset the balance of power. But despite these alliances, war soon erupted. A single event would soon tip the scale. So the final cause of the war is definitely going to be these alliances. This war definitely could have just been a European war. It could have been a localized war. But these alliances are going to be a domino effect. Okay, so it started actually with Germany, Austria, Hungary, Russia, you know, 25 years before World War One began. Russia was actually kicked out of, of the Central Powers Alliance. Um, Kaiser William II and Tsar Nicholas II were cousins, okay, so the leader of Germany and the leader of Russia were distant cousins, but had a disagreement, and so Germany broke off, <clears throat> excuse me, broke off the alliance with Russia, and so Russia is going to have an alliance with Britain and France, really just out of, not because they got along, because remember, Russia's long kind of been the rejects and never really accepted by anybody. I mean, think back to um, the Crimean War between Russia and the Ottoman, and when um, when the British and the French sided with the Ottoman, not the, the Russia. So Russia really has no friends in Europe, okay? They, nobody's really helping out Russia. So there's two major powers that align here, okay? So the central powers is Germany, Austria, Hungary, Italy, and the Ottoman Empire. Germany being the major force here. Italy, I always call them the little brother um, because in both World War One and World War II, they're kind of the sidekick. They kind of ride on the coattails of Germany. Germany's always the main power of the centralized powers. So Germany, Austria, Hungary, Italy, Ottoman. Then on the allied powers, it's France, Britain, Russia, and US, okay? And US will join later. Okay, so France and Britain are friends. Russia joins just out of the common enemy, that is Germany, all right, and then U.S. will join later. And this creates the domino effect and then because of their alliances. So what actually sparks it? Well, the spark, it should have been just a localized conflict. It should have been nothing. It should have been something that really we don't even talk about in world history, but it's a domino effect because of these alliances. So here's what happened. Kaiser Franz Joseph of Austria-Hungary had no direct descendants, okay? And so his closest descendant was his nephew, Franz Ferdinand, all right, who he wasn't particularly fond of. Franz Ferdinand was very emotional. In fact, he married for love, all right? And we all know that if you are a 
soon to be leader or you're going to inherit the throne being emotional is not a quality that anybody really you know appreciates okay you want someone who's strong you want someone who's looking to you know for alliances you want someone who is knows how to get the job done make those hard decisions so here's a picture of Franz Ferdinand and his wife Sophie okay before they were assassinated so here's what was going on Austria-Hungary is an example of where nationalism was tearing them apart right so what was going on is in one of their local um areas okay they had local serbs in bosnia okay which was a part of austria hungary who wanted to break away we're having nationalistic movements that was not a part of austria hungary so due to uh, a multi-ethnic multinational group right it was tearing them apart so kaiser or uh, sorry uh, Kaiser Franz Joseph is trying to suppress these groups. He's trying to, you know, not have internal rebellions. And so he decides, well, I'm old. I don't want to go on this campaign around all these different areas. Instead of being reactive, I'm going to be proactive. I'll send the nephew that I don't really like, okay, around to some of these hostile territories and maybe see if putting on a good face will help ease some of the tensions, okay, ease some of the tensions. So he sends his nephew, Franz Ferdinand, and his wife, Sophie, neither of which he liked, okay, on this campaign. Now, let's be real. You don't really normally send someone you like into hostile territories, okay, because there's a chance you could be assassinated. They, there was known to be um, terrorist groups or hostile groups, right, that might try to take out, um, you know, local leaders or plan attacks and stuff like that. But he didn't like this nephew anyway, so, so be it, okay? He was soft anyways. He wasn't strong. So Franz Ferdinand and his wife go on this campaign and they're on the train and they get into this local village where they're supposed to that afternoon be in an uncovered car and do kind of like a parade through the local village or local town. Okay. And again, supposed to, you know, schmooze, make friends with people, make them feel like, see, Austria Hungary cares about you. You don't want to rebel against us. See, we all, you know, we should all get along. We should all stick together. You know, don't rebel. Well, when he gets off the train, their local intelligence had found out that this local rebel group called the Black Hand that you can see here, all right, was in fact planning an assassination attempt on him and his wife. This gets back to part of the reason why Kaiser Franz Joseph didn't like him. He was emotional, not bright. He was not a bright man, okay, not known for being very bright. So I don't know about you. If someone came to me and told me there is there's hard evidence, official intelligence, that there is going to be an assassination attempt on your life. I don't know about you. To me, I don't go, right? Don't go assassination attempt on you what does Franz Ferdinand say oh no my uncle has sent me we have to go guy wasn't very bright so they go ahead with the parade against the security advice you know the local detail and, and intelligence and sure enough there's assassination attempt well first attempt missed him he's lucky and it unfortunately hit some of his security detail and killed some of his officers and some of them were wounded now Again, a smart man would rush to the train station, right, and would flee. Well, not Franz, not Franz Ferdinand, all right? Instead of going to the train station, he insisted on going to the hospital because he wanted to see the soldiers that are, you know, the, the, the guards that had been injured, and he felt really, really bad. Now, you can appreciate that he feels bad about them being injured, but the guy should leave. Like, they just attempted assassination attempt on you, okay? We had intelligence. They followed through on it. They could try again. Oh, no, no. We have to follow through. We have to see if they're okay. So instead of going to the train station, they continued en route to the hospital, and sure enough, they had another attempt because clearly their first shot wasn't a good shot, um, and this time their shot met their target and killed him and his wife the man was not smart okay um yeah the man died could have been avoided with his warning with the first attempt but no second attempt was successful in killing him and his wife now of course kaiser franz joseph can't put up with this he needs to track down this black hand suppress this movement you know appear strong and stuff like that but the reality is austria hungary wasn't doing well they didn't have a large military they really can't afford to like go to full-on war have internal civil war so he's got to find a way to like suppress the black hand without like sparking a whole internal war so he's trying to figure out like how to do this okay so he's got you know you've got this month between when he was a, a, a assassinated and when they actually go to war and the problem was is that you have germany in the ear of Austria saying, you can't let this go. You can't let this go. Germany saw an opportunity. Germany was looking to throw a punch and they were just looking for the opportunity. And here was the opportunity. The Serbs 
were descendants of Russia. So the Serbs were definitely willing to fight back against Austria because Russia had told them, we'll back you. So both had, you could say, more backbone than they usually would because Germany was backing Austria and Russia was backing the Serbs who were part of the Black Hand. So here's what happened. On June 28, 1914, in the capital of Bosnia, a village called Sarajevo, Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria and his wife Sophie were waving to the happy crowds from their motorcade when a young man leapt from the sidewalk and shot them both dead. The assassin turned out to be a member of a secret society called the Black Hand, whose goal was to reunite all Serbs under one rule. The assassination was used by the Austria-Hungary government as an opportunity to make an example of Serbia and squelch any nationalist uprisings in the future. One month later, Austria-Hungary declared war against Serbia. If it weren't for the military alliances, it might have been a relatively small, localized conflict. Instead, one nation after another was pulled into the fight due to their treaties of support. In order to aid its Serbian allies, Russia mobilized its armed forces. Germany, who was obligated by treaty to support Austria-Hungary, declared war on Russia two days after that. Subsequently, Germany declared war on Russia's ally, France. And one day later, Great Britain, who had a treaty with France, declared war on Germany and Austria-Hungary. World War I had begun. So here's how it happens. Germany backs Austria and says, whatever it takes, make them pay, because Germany sees an opportunity to pick the fight that they've been wanting, and here's their opportunity, they're gonna use Austria for that. The Serbs, which were Slavic of Russian descent, turned to Russia for help, otherwise they were in no position to take on Austria. Russia, of course, says that they'll back them, okay? So both are being inflated with, again, more support than they would actually normally have. But then, so really what it comes down to, what should have been a localized conflict and really been nothing, and Franz Ferdinand, who again, not to diminish him, really should be somebody that we probably wouldn't talk about in world history becomes the spark that started World War I. So here's what happens. This really becomes down to, it's not really about Austria and the Serbs, it's, it's between Germany and Russia, right? They hold the power because they're backing these two other powers, okay, which normally wouldn't go for it. Tsar Nicholas II sends a telegram to Kaiser William II of Germany. So the leader of Russia sends a telegram to the leader of Germany, which by the way, remember that they're distant cousins and says basically in so many words, look, this is getting out of hand. We don't need this to go to full-fledged war. I'll have, I'll call off the dogs, you know, we'll hand over the black hand if you, you know, if you tell Austria, you know, to take the black hand, but not punish all the Serbs. So he sends this letter saying, basically, we could smash all this, you know, we don't need this to get out of hand, you know, we'll be reasonable, hand over the black hand, you tell Austria, you know, punish them, but you don't need to punish all the Serbs. Germany is so desperate to start a fight that he says, no, heck no, let's do this. And so it could have been avoided, but the ego, like I said, Germany was looking for an opportunity and this was their opportunity. So. Russia begins to mobilize because, again, when your own family kicks you out of an alliance, you know, even before the war, you know something is coming. So they begin to mobilize even before Germany says no. Germany responds by declaring war on Russia, which Austria and the Serbs, you know, declare war on each other. Russia then calls in their chips and says, hey, France, remember that we have um, an alliance with one another? Germany tells France, hey, you better stay out of this. And remember, France is hypersensitive and looking to prove themselves that you don't tell us what to do. They say no. Germany declares war on France. And before you know it, then the war is on. So going into the fall of 1914, we have the war. Literally, the German soldiers were getting on the trains going to war, telling everybody they would be home by Christmas. Like They thought this would be a six-month war. They romanticized it. They thought this was be this would be quick and easy. Um, they were so confident, and in some ways it could have been um, for them. But their plans went wrong. You see, Germany had a plan. Germany had a plan. Germany's plan was the Schlieffen Plan. All right, and this was built long before 
World War I by Alfred Schlieffen to avoid a two-front war. When you look at the geography of Germany, um, their, their geography is honestly their biggest issue, right? They, they're they covered on all sides. You have Britain across the canal, you have Belgium, you have France on their western front, you have Italy to the south, and you have Russia to the east, okay? And I don't care if you have the biggest, baddest army in the world, you can't fight all of them. You have to pick a side. You know, you can't, you can't, even if you have the biggest, baddest army, you can't afford to fight all three at once. Well, they had Italy as their main ally, okay? But they still had to find a way not to fight Russia, France, and Britain all at the same time. So, the Schlieffen plan Okay, which I love this word, okay? Every year when this word comes up, I always walk around the house and my poor husband's always just like, he's like, oh, are you teaching World War One? Because I'll be like, that went Schlieffen wrong or this is Schlieffen amazing, okay? So the plan was to avoid the two front war, to not fight the Western front and the Eastern front, okay? So here's what their plan was. Their plan was Russia is slow to mobilize. Russia is not gonna be ready to fight at first. It's gonna take them six months to a year before they're actually ready to fight. They were behind in the Industrial Revolution. They were still living in serfdom and there, there was some truth to this, okay? And they thought we're gonna attack through Belgium, which was neutral, and this was true, and we're gonna take Paris quickly. And if we could take Paris quickly, let's be honest, your capital city is like your heartbeat. We take that, the rest falls. It's gonna scare uh, Britain into submission and they'll stay out of it. And then all we'll have to do is turn our attention to Russia. So they thought this is a surefire plan. This shouldn't be a problem. Well, they underestimated, all right? So their plan to wrap up the Western Front, right? attack through Belgium, Belgium won't do anything, Britain will be caught off by surprise, we'll take France, because they're an easy target, and then by the time we wrap all that up, Russia will be just getting it together six months later, we'll be ready to, you know, do the Eastern Front. So we'll do the Western Front first, then we'll do the Eastern Front. That's not how it happened. So Germany t started out with their plan. They attacked through France, but when they went into Belgium, Belgium had a secret alliance with Britain. Britain enters the war right away. So that's the first thing that goes wrong. They weren't expecting that. Russia had started to mobilize long before uh, Germany declared war. Because again, when your own family kicks you out of an alliance, they were secretly planning. And so the Eastern Front becomes a threat right when Germany starts to invade France. Not only does Britain enter the war, so now they have more forces they're fighting. They're not just fighting the French, they're fighting the British and the French, so that's harder. They get news that Russia is marching on their Eastern Front. So they have to send half their troops to the Western Front. Now, this started in nice weather, but as you move into the fall, by October or November, it's cold. And then this slows everything down. And before you know it, they enter into a four-year stalemate of trench warfare warfare. So the Schlieffen plan went Schlieffen wrong. <laughs> and they enter into what is trench warfare, okay, which turns into four years on the eastern western front of two main lines facing one another, Germans facing the French and the British and Germans facing the Russians, and they're just at a standstill. Okay, and here's basically how it looks. So you have the no man's land here that you can see, right, with craters, on um, you know, from the mortar holes and stuff from from all the different capsules and shells and bombs and stuff like that. So you have your front line, which is zigzag, zigzag, which is where your soldiers would fight from. Then you have your connector line, okay, to your support trench. So your support trench, this is where they could get extra ammo, rest, uh, maybe eat, you know, supply lines, medics, stuff like that. Then you would have your reserve trench, and this is where maybe men could sleep. Um, when they're off duty so they would switch out you know posts maybe on duty for 12 hours off duty for 12 hours um, you know cooking and you know recovery and stuff like that okay because you obviously can't be above the lines because you could be shot now these trenches were about six feet wide seven to eight feet deep so that you could walk and you know your head would get shot off now the reason they were zigzag is because from the other side, if they shot at you, once they got your coordinates, they could just basically line it up and take you out. So you zigzag it so they never really know exactly the coordinates. Also, if the other side was to break through and get into your trench, you don't want them just to turn and be able to shoot straight down your line. Okay, so you zigzag it to create some protection for yourself. The trenches were absolutely disgusting. Okay, um, they were, they were, 
more men died from the conditions in the trenches than from the actual warfare itself um, and stuff. So here you can see men, they kind of dug into the side to create kind of a place to hunker down and sleep or, you know, rest. Um, when it would rain, they would just kind of turn into sopping mess and mud would just fill the bottom of the trenches. Um, so here you can see, you know, in the bottom when it would rain, um, it would easily fill with a foot to 18 inches of mud. So these men would just be standing in their wool socks and leather boots in mud, um, which would just be gross. The conditions in the trenches were, again, more of an issue sometimes than the actual warfare itself. Um, what they would do in the, the support trenches is they would take basically wood, two by fours and stuff, and they would brace them between the sides of the trenches and they could create bunk beds, okay? And then you just throw down plywood and then you could create bunks for men to sleep on. In this bottom right hand picture, you can see where this man has been injured, right? And his feet on the right foot, he has one toe left. He's basically got foot rot. And gangrene and disease just overtakes um, the foot because when your feet are constantly wet, on, then they start to rot. And so the constant thing that these men are fighting against is the wet conditions and keeping their feet dry. During the Vietnam War, uh, they say that they imported more than anything else socks because of the wet conditions and the rainforest and the wet season. Men were constantly having to change their socks every couple hours because they were constantly on um, trench foot, what they would call it, or Right, but there's a lot of different words for it, but in the same kind of thing, because this was almost more deadly to you than enemy fire. And it was a real thing that you had to watch out for. As Germany invaded the neutral country of Belgium, no one foresaw how long the war would last and how gruesome the cost would be. Over 65 million people fought. Over 20 million were wounded. Between 9 and 10 million died on the battlefield, and another 20 million lost their lives due to hunger and disease related to the war. The magnitude of the killing was unprecedented. In just the first three months of the war, nearly the entire original British army was wiped out. Despite all the carnage, the battle lines remained almost stationary in France. The Western Front, as it was known, was defined by two lines of trenches zigzagging across northern and eastern France for thousands of miles. Wide enough for two men to walk abreast and stand erect to fire their machine guns, the trenches were choked with mire, rats, and lice. German soldiers occupied one line, Allied soldiers the other. Between them lay a no-man's land, filled with barbed wire and mud, smoldering with bomb craters. From time to time, soldiers would storm out of these trenches and attempt to overrun the enemy, only to be met with a hail of bullets. Both sides suffered hundreds of thousands of casualties while accomplishing practically nothing, as the battle lines remained essentially unchanged. Meanwhile, the tools of technology, which had provided prosperity for the industrialized world, were now being used to create more efficient and more ghastly weapons. A soldier described the shocking sight of a machine gun that could fire 500 to 600 bullets per minute. I saw trees as large as a man's thigh, literally cut down by the stream of blood. In 1914, the German army deployed their new cannon against Belgium. Big Bertha, as it was called, could hurl an 1,800-pound shell nine miles. A year later, at the Second Battle of Ypres, the Germans introduced poison gas to warfare. Soon, both sides used chemical weapons like chlorine, which suffocated its victims, or mustard gas that burned the skin and blinded its casualties. By 1916, the British Army began using tanks in battle with great success. Before long, however, German soldiers realized that flamethrowers, weapons that could shoot a stream of flaming gasoline, could be used to stop them. Balloons and then airplanes were converted into weapons of war. When Germany attacked the Belgian city of Liege in 1914, it was the first time civilians were killed by a war plane. Planes were fitted with machine guns and loaded with bombs, and soon began dueling in air-to-air -air combat. These dogfights became a common sight over the skies of Europe. 
Germany's leading fighter pilot, Manfred Richthofen, nicknamed the Red Baron by the British because of his brightly painted red albatross airplane, shot down 80 Allied aircraft before being struck by a bullet from the trenches and crashing to his death. If I should come out of this war alive, I will have more luck than brains. Even more destruction was waiting on and under the Atlantic Ocean as Germany pressed its Unterseeboots, its submarines, into the battle. German submarines, U-boats, patrolled the Atlantic, firing torpedoes on merchant ships, trying to deliver supplies to the Allies. It aroused the anger of Americans in particular because they felt that this was a violation of the principle of the freedom of the seas, long a cornerstone of United States foreign policy. Germany then launched a U-boat blockade in response to the British blockade along the German coast, which in theory prevented contraband, weapons and military supplies, from reaching Germany. But the British definition of contraband was wide-sweeping, including food and fertilizer for crops. 750,000 Germans died of starvation during the British blockade. 75,000 people lost their lives due to German submarine warfare. The blockades continued the pattern of war begun in the trenches. Everywhere, the fighting was inconclusive. While the new technologically advanced weapons made the lack of victories more devastating. The thing that made World War I so unique is that you have all these new technologies. It's kind of like the first time you drive a car. You know, it's not the same as playing with it on your Wii or in an arcade, right? When you actually drive the car and, or even like say riding a quad and then you actually drive a car. When you drive a car, it's a different experience. And so in the 1800s, the second half, 1850, 1819, they have all these new technologies and World War I is really kind of the first time using them in a real war scenario, so to speak. And the inexperience leads to this stalemate, both sides making a lot of errors and nobody really ever, you know, getting the advantage. So let's talk about gas warfare here for a second. Um, so this is great as long as the wind is going in the right direction, right? But what happens when the wind changes direction? Then the very mustard gas that your tear gas, you know, or chlorine gas that you're using on your enemy, right? Now it becomes a weapon against your own men. Um, you don't have enough um, gas mass for your men. You know, you're, you're, you're not as experienced with the impact of that and how to treat it. So there's a lot of trial and error with weapons and is the risk really worth it? Just because I can take out my enemy, if I, ha if I run the same risk of the wind changing, is it worth it, right, when it can be used against my own men? Right. And this is why gas warfare really today is not used, um, along with humanity issues, you know, the humaneness of it as well. I mean, that's another argument, but just the practicality of it, of, you know, when you're in face to face combat, you know, if you don't have the proper equipment and things can go wrong and a lot of things went wrong. Other new weapons, Big Bertha, like they talked about, um, these were amazing when it came to invade, invading of cities. I mean, these could fire eight to 10 miles away, so it could really give you an advantage before you ever make contact. Tanks were introduced during World War I. Uh, became kind of inefficient, though, because they would break down a lot. So they're great until the flamethrower comes along or they break down and then you're kind of a sitting duck. World War II tanks will really take on a, a new level. By far the number one weapon or the most impactful weapon of World War I is the machine gun, okay, the machine gun. So if you're gonna like make note for the test, uh, rapid fire machine gun is the most deadly weapon of World War I or the biggest impact of causing the stalemate because you have one, I have one. And the strategy is we just, we don't know how to get past one another and it really causes the stalemate. So let's take a look at what the daily rations like of food for these men in the trenches look like. Okay, so for the British, um, you know, some meat, some bread, bacon, cheese, sugar, jam, pepper, um, dried fruits, vegetables, lime juice, you know, for scurvy, um, tobacco, half gallon of rum, half gallon of rum at the discretion of a general, alcohol alcohol on the front lines. That's not something you expect to see. Well, let's look at the German side. 
bread, biscuits, fresh fish or uh, frozen meat, uh, potatoes, vegetables, coffee, sugar, tobacco, um, you know, or cigarettes, and then beer or wine, spirits, beer or wine. Why are they giving their men alcohol? Think about this. These men are in the trenches. Is alcohol going to help? Think about this day after day, night after night. They're staring. They're waiting. Most of the time, there is no fighting going on. It's silent. You're waiting. It's quiet. Month after month. You were supposed to be home in six months. You haven't had a letter from home in, in eight months. You don't know what's going on. Your morale is low. Your foot is starting to rot. You don't know if you're going to keep your foot. More men were injured during the war than died from the war. And the injuries were more devastating, honestly, in some ways than death. Men, in a lot of cases, wished for death. It's not like today where there's prosthetics and there's so many surgeries that can 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 help maximize or undo the injuries of war. And even then you can't undo all of it, right? But back then it was just, if you were injured, you, you, were, you were stuck with it most likely, it was, it was permanent. And so a lot of men would wish for death. It was so devastating. And the emotional toll, PTSD was not something that was recognized at that time. And the emotional toll, you know, think about it. Last week, your, your buddy's uh, platoon went and, and invaded and half of them didn't come back. And the other half, they lost their arm and, he, and one has an infection. And the other one, you just found out his wife left him. You, you're, you're losing it. Your mental capacity, you are losing it. You are losing it. So when they, when, they, when they come up with the terms like liquid courage or things like that, alcohol was a distraction. It, it helped to numb the pain. It helped to give false courage. It helped to calm the nerves. It helped to just kind of ease the pain, help you zone out because it was rough on both sides. And so alcohol definitely had a place and both sides allowed it. And men definitely used it to numb the pain, to get through it, to not think sometimes because thinking was really dangerous under the circumstances that they were in. And, um, and they struggled. They really, really struggled. One of the best propagandas that they would do, the Germans did this and it was really successful. So what they would do is they would fly over the trenches and they would take paper and they would throw it over the trenches so that paper would just litter the trenches, right? So you'd pick up the piece of paper and they would look at this piece of paper and it would show a woman, um, you know, scandalously dressed, you know, maybe in a negligee, like a, like a revealing nighty or something like that. Okay. And she would be kind of standing in the doorway of like an apartment or, you know, entering an apartment or something like that. Okay. And it would say, you know, something like, you know, I'm so lonely, you know, I don't hear from my man anymore. And then there might be another bubble saying, you know, and then a shadow of a man saying, I'm here for you. Okay. Now, this sounds very silly, right? Okay. And you probably look at it if you were the guy in the trench, you know, this is ridiculous. You know, like this is insinuating, you know, that your girl back home, you don't know what she's doing. Maybe she's cheating on you. Maybe she's left you, you know, maybe she's, you know, with somebody else. And of course you'd see this, you'd be like, huh, nice try. You know, they're so stupid. What are they trying to say? But then think about the quiet. Think about the dead of night. You haven't had a letter from home and six months. Um, you haven't heard from your girl. You, you haven't seen your family. Um, you know, so-and-so whose girl or family left them, you know, they got a letter and she just couldn't wait anymore. She met somebody else and she moved on or she heard that they got injured and she wasn't going to wait around. And, and we've all been there, right? Where sometimes the unknown, what does our mind do? Plays tricks or games on us. And then you're sitting there waiting. You're like, you're like so stupid stupid Germans putting, you know, putting this propaganda in our, you know, you know, trying to mess with my mind. But then what does it start to do? Mess with your mind, right? And so they would do this kind of propaganda and it worked and it would start to mess with these guys' minds. And they start to be like, she wouldn't cheat on me, would she? No, no, she wouldn't do that to me. Not, not me, not me. No, not my girl, not my girl. And then you, Maybe she would, you know, I haven't, I haven't heard from her in a while. And then your buddy would be like, don't worry about that, dude. Don't let it get in your head. But then it would start to get in your head. And so guys would smoke and drink anything to numb the pain. Do you see what I mean? Like the war was hard enough, but the longevity of the stalemate was what made it just so exhausting for so many men. The stalemate led to total war. 
okay? So what do I mean by total war? Um, it wasn't just the men fighting on the fronts. Um, countries literally had to adjust how they did things back home. Um, they had to change things because it became very expensive, very, very expensive because they weren't making progress. This wasn't over right away. This was a four-year not going anywhere. So they had to make adjustments at home. So they had to raise taxes. Um, they had to borrow money. They had to ration food. So going to the stores, think about the beginning of the pandemic. Like when you went to the grocery stores, all of a sudden it was like, couldn't find rice, couldn't find bread, couldn't find meat. You had to kind of like, you know, toilet paper, right? There for a minute, people couldn't find toilet papers. You were lucky if you could find it, you had to ration it a little bit. So during the war, they had to ration things. They had to set prices. They could, they had to forbid strikes so people wouldn't walk out of the factories because they had to manufacture or be really consistent manufacturing weapons and supplies, things needed for the men so they could keep up the war effort because um, it was very expensive. Propaganda was everywhere. Um, they had to control freedom of speech. So, you know, we talk a lot about freedom of speech in this country. And the reality is during both world wars, freedom of speech was a pre was was restricted. If you were against the war, you were you weren't allowed to speak out. They needed people to be on board and to be to be unified. OK, uh, because we needed we needed to be focused on the cause at hand and not be divisive. And so there was a lot of restrictions and um, people like to forget about that. You know, it's really easy to talk about the victories of the war and it's really easy to forget about how hard it was for people back home and how many things that they lost. You know, women would go to women had to go to work. Women had to leave the homes and go to work because men left the factories and were fighting. Factories were converted, you know, from producing luxury goods to producing goods for the war. You would go to the grocery store and you could only buy certain products. Um, you were restricted. Um, propaganda everywhere. And women really had to fill the shoes of men. Women had to really step up and fill the shoes of men um, because of this. You know, they were called to do this. And young men, it was when you were graduating from high school, it wasn't if, it was what branch in the military you're going to join. Are you going to go and do the right thing? And propaganda was everywhere. And propaganda even started to filtrate into the United States. The United States was very resistant to get into the war. Why? Because we saw it as a European problem. You know, we were making a killing off of this as well. Um, Britain and France were going so far into debt. And guess who was there to sell them products? Guess who was there to give them a loan? Guess who was making a ton of money? We were. So for the first part of the war, um, we weren't fighting in the war, but we were supplying the Allied powers all the stuff they needed and making a killing off of it. Now, Britain and France wanted us desperately to come into the war, but we were in no rush to get into the war. We were loving the idea of selling goods to Britain and France and making money off of it. And we're like, oh, you need another loan? That's okay. We'll just add a little interest to that. So we were making a ton of money off of the first part of the war and saw it as not our problem. We saw it as a European problem, not a world problem. So we definitely tried for a long time to stay out of the war while capitalizing off of it economically. Okay. So after three years, there's a total moral collapse. Why? Well, nothing is happening. The trenches literally aren't moving. Nations are on the verge of collapse. Um, troops start to mutiny. Food becomes scarce. Generals are failing to achieve the promised victories. It's like a staring contest. Someone eventually has to blink. You know, normally when we're in person, I literally have people come up and we do staring contests on this on this day at this point, okay? We see who can be the victor, you know? And what starts to happen toward the end of the staring contest? The eyes start to burn, right? You're like, oh, it burns so bad. This was burning so bad for nations. By 1917, everyone is burning. No one's doing well. Everyone is dying, starvation, debt, uh, the trenches, the, just from warfare, back home. Everyone is fatigued. It's just who's going to give in first? Who is, who's going to give up? And the answer is who's going to blink first? And the answer is Russia. Russia's going to blink first, okay? So part two, we'll talk about how Russia leaves the war. And so Germany thinks now that the two front war is over, Russia leaves the war. Now they can pit all their attention on Britain, France and change the tide. But they make a mistake bringing the U.S. into the war and it tips the war. OK, so we'll talk about Russia's exit of the war, how they blink first 
okay? After almost a four-year stalemate, the U.S. entry into the war, and then how this tips the scales and how we wrap up World War um, World War One. Okay, so this is going to conclude part one, and then you're going to watch part two again to watch Russia's exit from the war, what brings the U.S. into the war, and how Germany. So first, the Schlieffen plan goes Schlieffen wrong. They open up a two-front war, and then Germany makes a second mistake. All right bringing the U.S. into the war, all right, which um, is going to, they had an advantage, and then they're going to calculate wrong yet again, all right, so this will wrap up part one. A change in American attitude occurred when the British ship Lusitania was sunk by a German U-boat. Of the 1,198 who were killed, there were 128 Americans. More ships were sunk, incurring more loss of American lives. When the German Kaiser announced on January 31, 1917, that U-boats would sink all ships in British waters, whether they were hostile or neutral, there seemed little choice but to enter the war. The discovery of the Zimmermann telegram cemented that decision. It was a coded note from German Foreign Minister Arthur Zimmermann to the German minister in Mexico, promising U.S. territory to Mexico in return for joining the German cause. We make Mexico a proposal or alliance on the following basis. Make war together, make peace together, generous financial support, and an understanding on our part that Mexico is to reconquer the lost territory in Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona. Thankfully, the war was coming to a conclusion. Russia had already withdrawn from the battle after the Bolshevik Revolution. The Allied forces had aided the anti-Bolsheviks, however, and this led to long-term mistrust between Russia and the Allies. By November of 1918, the Allies, with fresh new American forces, began to turn the tide of battle, and German soldiers began to retreat along the Western Front. The German Navy ordered its fleet to set out to sea, but the sailors refused. In Germany, soldiers and civilians started organizing revolutionary councils. The people of Berlin rebelled against the Kaiser, 
who abdicated his throne and escaped to the Netherlands. No final decisive battle was fought. No Allied soldiers entered German territory. Instead, the German war machine ground to a halt. On the 11th hour of the 11th day, in the 11th month of 1918, Germany agreed to a ceasefire that ended the war. Captain Eddie Rickenbacker, America's ace fighter pilot, flew over the trenches when the armistice was declared. On both sides of no man's land, the trenches erupted. Brown uniform men poured out of the American trenches, gray-green uniforms out of the German. I watched them throw their helmets in the air, discard their guns, wave their hands. Suddenly, gray uniforms mixed with brown. I could see them hugging each other, dancing, jumping. The bloodiest war to date was finally over. During its four long years, more than 30 nations participated in battle and in death. But even as the war ended, Americans faced still another crisis. A crisis at home that took more lives than the war itself. A flu epidemic gripped the country, and approximately 25% of the population fell ill with high fevers, headaches, and often pneumonia. About 500,000 Americans died. Businesses shut down, telephone service was curtailed, and corpses lay unburied due to a shortage of coffins. The epidemic, like the war, finally subsided, and a weary America looked to President Wilson and the victorious allies to deliver a lasting peace. Even before the war was over, Wilson had presented his plan for peace to Congress, his 14 points speech. We entered this war because violations of right had occurred, which touched us to the quick and made the life of our own people impossible. Wilson's first five points dealt with the issues he felt had caused the war. Nations should no longer engage in secret treaties. The freedom of the seas must be restored and tariffs should be lowered or removed altogether so free trade could flourish. Wilson demanded an end to the arms race and stockpiling of weapons. He declared that the interest and desires of people living in colonies should be considered by the imperialist countries who ruled them. Wilson's next points addressed boundary changes. Advocating the principle of self-determination, Wilson wanted any new national boundaries to be drawn along historically established lines of allegiance and nationality. His last point was the most important to Wilson. He called for the formation of a League of Nations to keep world peace. The members of the League would agree to protect each other from aggression and settle grievances without going to war. Following the ceasefire in December of 1918, Wilson and his wife Edith sailed aboard the SS George Washington for Europe to attend the Versailles Peace Conference. It was the first time in history that an American president left the United States while in office. Wilson was given a hero's welcome. Crowds cheered him. The citizens of Europe saw Wilson as their best hope for a lasting world peace. But the politicians of Europe, particularly British Prime Minister Lloyd George, who had won election on the slogan, Make Germany Pay, and French Prime Minister Georges Clemenceau, who had lived through two German invasions of France, resisted most of Wilson's ideas. To them, the first and foremost goal of the peace treaty was to punish Germany so she could never wage war again. The peace conference did not include the defeated central powers, Russia and the smaller allied countries. The so-called Big Four, America, Great Britain, France and Italy, hammered out the peace treaty among themselves. Time and again, Wilson was forced to concede on elements of his 14 points in return for the establishment of the League of Nations. Finally, on June 28, 1919, the Big Four, along with the leaders of the defeated nations, met at the Palace of Versailles to sign the treaty. The Treaty of Versailles created nine new nations, including Poland, Czechoslovakia, and Yugoslavia while the borders of other countries were redrawn. Four sections of the Ottoman Empire were made temporary colonies under the rule of France and Great Britain.
until they were ready for independence. President Wilson did manage to prevent some of the more extreme punishments, but the treaty demilitarized Germany, banning her air force and navy and limiting her army to only 100,000 men. Germany was ordered to return Alsace-Lorraine to France. Most debilitating, Germany had to pay reparations, war damages of 33 billion dollars to the Allies and admit total responsibility for the war. Certainly, Germany had played a major role in starting World War I, but other countries were equally involved. German citizens found the treaty outrageous, and there was no way the country could ever repay the Allies the money demanded. Instead of providing a lasting peace, the Treaty of Versailles began laying the groundwork for World War II. 